Okay, everyone, I'll call the workshop session to order. Are we okay? Okay, call the workshop to order. The first item is uh, discussion and updates related to COVID-19 pandemic. Chief Smith. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Hope you are all doing well today. Uh, the numbers that I'm giving you today are from Department of State Health Services. I did not get a report from Region 7 this past Friday. So all these numbers are gonna be from DSHS. Uh, currently in the state of Texas, uh, total number of COVID, vaccine, or COVID cases, 3,492,166. For Lampasas County, we're at 2,976. Uh, if you do the math real quick from past information, this means that we had a pretty good two weeks. We only added 39 cases in the last two weeks. So that is a good number. Uh, active cases in the state, we're down to 114,488. This number two weeks ago was 180,000. So we've dropped significantly in that area also. Active cases in Lampasas County, we're down to 67. New cases of COVID for the week, or excuse me, just today across the state, 1,560 uh, fatalities recorded today were 17. DSHS still shows that we have 62 fatalities for Lampasas County. Hospitalizations across the state are down also. We're down at 4,078. Two weeks ago, we were at 9,719. Uh, in our trauma service area L, we have 69 total COVID patients in the hospital. 51 are in general beds, 16 are in ICU, and then we have 12 uh, COVID patients that are on ventilators at this time. We do also have two pediatric patients that are in the hospital, but they are not in ICU of any kind. As far as vaccinations, uh, with at least one shot in the zip code 76550, we have 5,722. This is an increase of 65 people. Fully vaccinated, we're at 4,961. This is an increase of 102. Put that together with Lamb Passes County, at least one shot, 9,872. This is an additional 76 people. And then the fully vaccinated, 8,577. This is an additional 99 on top of that. Uh, demographics on fatalities, I was not able to get this week. I apologize for that. Does anybody have any other questions on COVID-19? You had a, uh, a shot seminar. <laughs> You gave some shots out last week. How did that go? Uh, it went real well. Uh, kind of the only problem with the clinics that we're doing, people are waiting until later in the day whenever people get off work, when kids get out of school, that type of thing, and they're always done by that time. The first time, they were done by 1 o'clock. They brought extras this last time, and I think they did 143 vaccines by 2.15 or 3 o'clock. We are going to host another one. I just got word from Donna Clark. Uh, with the LISD, and I believe the date, I want to say maybe, I, I don't have the date yet. We'll, okay. we'll put it on social media, we'll put it on our webpage, uh, but she'll get something out on that, but it's coming up soon, and it'll be boosters for all three of the vaccines. Right. So we're, we're still trying and working with that to try to get it accomplished. Anyone have any questions for Mr. Smith? Thank you, sir. Next item is discussion and updates relating to the pre-treatment data collection, assessment, and site plan. I'm not presenting this item. I'm just making a few brief comments. I'm not about to translate Jason's uh, memo to you. Uh, however, uh, we did want to talk just briefly to you as staff about next, uh, uh, next items or, or things that we will be considering in the future. Uh, this is on an agenda to provide you an update as we have done. Gosh, since we started this uh, back in December of uh, 20, and uh, we've reported to you through manager reports, emails, CIP report, uh, the council planning session in July, we spent spend a fair amount of time on it. Uh, tonight's report, I, I, in my estimation, can be considered somewhat of a milestone. Uh, it appears that there's some consensus in terms of the technology that will work that uh, uh, perhaps will be slightly less expensive than what we originally anticipated in a conventional uh, treatment uh, uh, facility. Uh, and I think probably as important as anything else uh, because it reduces a loading to uh, the extent it does uh, will extend the uh, life of our wastewater treatment facility uh, prior to us having to upgrade or expand. 
I think the next steps, and Jason might speak to this as well, uh, would probably uh, obviously meeting with uh, meeting and refining the technology and the uh, uh, different facilities will be installed with the consulting engineers from uh, Ajinomoto Foods North America, uh, deser uh, confirm the design technology, and uh, at some point here, perhaps in the next two to three months, we would go out and request a, a proposal uh, for design uh, from our consulting engineers. We, uh, we will also, I think, here very shortly begin a conversation with uh, AFNA uh, about uh, the cost, cost methodology. What you have been presented previously are estimates. And the estimates also include a costing methodology uh, for both the city's uh, cost for what benefits the city versus the processor's cost for what benefits them. Um, and it's certainly as we begin these conversations, uh, it's certainly staff's position, and I would be hopeful that it's council's position, that uh, a, a party receiving a benefit uh, from infrastructure should be responsible for the cost of that infrastructure. So that's, that's, that's the starting point, I think, with any discussion. There may be some discussion regarding a methodology, et cetera, but um, those are kind of on the horizon as I see it. Uh, again, we've got a lot of work to do on this program, uh, but I would uh, defer to uh, Jason for anything and all things uh, related to the technology and uh, what they've been able to put together. Finley? Whether you or, or, he, or Jason covers it, uh, I talked a little bit with Finley today, and as far as dollars and cents, if we're going out for uh, bonding, uh, today's dollars are less than five years down the road or ten years down the road, whatever we end up doing. But I think it's very important to consider phase one and phase two together in regards to the cost. With, with our initial discussions, that's been my personal opinion, but uh, uh, certainly we've got, a, we've got some work to do. Mayor Council, thank you for having me here today, and I'll, I'm going to be as brief as I can and answer any questions, because I know there's probably lots of questions. Um, would you like for me to go back through the process? you know, to explain how things flow through the plant. Would that be helpful a little bit? Okay, okay, so um, I think there's a, there's a site plan that was handed out to council that was in our memorandum that didn't make the packets. Um, and I got a hard copy here in front of me. It's got an aerial photograph on the back of it. It's just a picture, an aerial picture of the wastewater treatment plant, okay? There's also a process flow diagram that was more than likely handed out that looks um, a little more scientific like this. That's the process flow diagram. But I don't think you need to reference this. You can just look at the picture of the aerial photograph, and I can just walk you through what the process flow diagram says. So. Anyhow, just kind of take a step back. What, the, what you're seeing right now is the, the flow from engine to motor comes down to dedicated wastewater pipeline to the plant through the pretreatment facility. And the purpose of the pretreatment is to knock the, the BOD, what we call it, the strength of that wastewater down to something closer to domestic strength that your wastewater plant's designed for, right? And so it goes, the first thing it does is it goes through a little on-site lift station that pumps the flow up into an equalization basin that's the center of an old bullseye wastewater treatment plant that was the city's wastewater plant before the racetrack design that you have now. So that, that bullseye plant that's kind of in the center of your photograph here has more or less been repurposed and reused. And the center ring of that bullseye is EQ, it's an equalization basin, it's a very important part of the process because Anjanomoto does different things throughout the day and throughout the weekend at their plant. You know the they're a 24-7 operation. Sometimes they're making food. Sometimes they're cleaning their facilities. And so the, the product that they're sending you is very differently between those two times. And so we've got a big basin that we can mix those two different products. So what your plant is seeing is very consistent. And the biology in these treatment process likes consistency. It likes consistency in flow, 
and water quality. And so that's what that equalization basin does for you. That's, that's important. Um, from there, it goes to the aeration tanks where the, the, that's where the biological process happens and the bugs break down to biosolids and that's basically you're adding air to those aeration basins. We've got some air mixing there and we're feeding the bugs with air in the food um, in those aeration tanks. And so that's what's going on there. That's the, the rectangular concrete structure that's there now. It's called exi existing aeration tank on that, on that process. And currently inside that existing aeration tank, the next step in the process is to separate the solids from the liquids. And there's a little clarifier inside that existing aeration tank in the top right hand corner. Um, the purpose of that is the water kind of gets still in there and the solids sink in a traditional clarifier and the water goes over the top of a weir. That's what's supposed to happen in a clarifier. Okay, you're supposed to have enough detention time in that clarifier to where the water doesn't go through there so fast that it carries the solids with it over the top. It's supposed to slow down and settle down the solids to go over the top, okay? And the clean water goes through another treatment process and all this water goes through your main plant before it goes in the creek. Obviously the water gets discharged clean and the solids then have to be separated from the water before they're hauled off. And that's your solids handling process. Um, so from those existing aeration tanks, essentially they go back to that equalization basin, that bullseye plant, the outer ring on that has got some labels on here called sludge. And that's where your solids are coming off your clarifiers and they're going into the sludge holding basins. And they're, they're sitting there, they're continuing to get aerated and they're kind of waiting to go through what we call a belt filter press. And a belt filter press squeezes out the water. And so you have what we call a cake coming off of one end of the belt filter press and that gets hauled to the landfill and the water goes back through the process, okay? So your EQ, aeration, clarification, and then solids handling is essentially the four processes. We're not changing any of that. We're just upgrading all of those processes, okay? So what we've been talking about in this memorandum and the difference between what we did in the last six weeks and what we presented to you earlier this year is the solid separation process. And that's what this suspended air flotation technology is doing for you. And that's what we've been focusing on. So in a traditional clarifier, your water gets still in that clarifier and your solids are gonna sink. And the solids get pulled off the bottom of the clarifier. We're kind of flipping that around with the SAF. So we're floating the solids to the top of a much smaller basin with the SAF. And the way that works is we're injecting an air into the bottom of froth in the bottom of the SAF. And so that air bubble, it it's literally looks like the froth that you would in a latte or something, you know. The air bubbles are too small to see, so it kind of looks like a milky water is what it looks like. But those little bitty tiny air bubbles are grabbing hold of the solids particles in that, in that basin, and they're pushing them up to the top of the basin. And so that, and then that gets skimmed off the top, and it goes back to your sludge holding basins, and the clean water comes off the bottom. So that's the difference between a SAF and what we presented to you before, okay? And so the, the fundamental difference about that, I like the SAF in a, it's used in industrial pretreatment because you're, you're treating something different from municipal waste most of the time in industrial pretreatment. And the value of that SAF is you're getting a lot of grease from Anginomoto and that kind of thing, and grease naturally floats anyways. So that, that's a good way to handle that grease load. Um, the other value of it is whenever you're floating your solids, you're, I'm not going to explain the chemistry to you, but you're actually getting a higher solids concentration off of your float, whereas if it's settling down in a clarifier, you've got more water in that solids that you're pulling off the clarifier. And so the higher concentration of solids coming off the top means that you've got less volume of solids going to that outer bullseye ring of the, of the plant in the sludge holding basins. And so you can reduce the volume that you need for your solids in your solids handling process, okay? Um, so that's one benefit of it. There's another benefit on the front end is the, in order to make the solids sink in a regular clarifier, you've got to run your solids content in that aeration basin at like a three to 4,000 parts per million. And in this particular instance where we're floating the solids, we can run it at six to eight thousand parts per million in your aeration basin, which means you need a smaller aeration basin. So if you run into that higher concentration in your aeration basin, typically you can't get your solids to float and sink in a clarifier. 
but if you're going to float them, that means you can concentrate the solids more in the aeration, and you're concentrating the solids more in your back end, your basin sizes become smaller. And so there's the value, and that's why we've got some cost savings. So our aeration basin sizes went down about 30%, and our solids holding sizes went down more than 50% in our end product. So, um, you know, there's, I think that Anjinomoto brought some value to the table with their process engineers. Um, that was a good thing. We typically look at this from a municipal treatment process. TCEQ doesn't necessarily recognize this in their rules, but we've crossed that bridge with TCEQ. They've said, this is okay. You don't need to follow our rules because this is pre-treatment. And you've still got a, a wastewater treatment plant that's designed per our rules that's got a discharge permit associated with it. Okay, so this particular plant is not releasing the water to the creek. So we don't need to follow their basin sizing rules. That allows us to use this alternate technology. So the down, there's some downfalls, of course, with the alternate technology, it's operations. And we've been vetting that. Um, we feel a little more comfortable with it than we did before. And we're gonna put some things into place in the site plan so that 10 years from now, if this SAF technology proves to be an unreliable um, operation, we've got room on the site to go back and put in that conventional clarifier and build more aeration basins and build more solids handling, which looks very similar to what we did in our original proposal. Now, Jason, the people that you've talked to with the SAF already, how long mm -hmm. have they had this system? They've been doing this for 30 years. For how many? 30 years. 30? Yes, in the industrial pretreatment. And they've told us, they're a company based out of California. They've told us that their fastest growing business base is the municipal wastewater sector. And so that was, that was encouraging. Yeah. Um, they've got some of these going in in California. Uh, we haven't seen any in Texas in the municipal side yet, though. Um, they've, we're going to put this unit in a building. Um, one of our concerns was the chemistry that's required to run this unit. We did some jar testing to kind of get a better feel for that. The, the good news is the same chemical, the polymer that you would use to add to this water before it goes to the SAF unit is the same polymer that you already are using at the site for the belt press. So you're familiar with that polymer, you're already purchasing it, and, and it'll actually reduce the amount of polymer that you need in your belt press facility because you're adding it for the SAF. And so the net gain of chemical costs is not as high as we thought it was going to be. Um, and we were actually quite surprised at how low that was going to be. Um, but I think the, the way to make this thing work is going to be that equalization basin and making some improvements in that guy um, and designing some kind of fail safes in here. There's another little diagram that y'all handed out, handed out to you. It's, an, it's a picture of the building that this is going to go in. Figure A2. And this building on the site plan is up there in the top right hand corner. We had always proposed a new belt press building and a new belt filter press because the existing one is aging and it needs to be replaced. So we came up with the concept of putting the SAF unit in underneath the same roof as that belt filter press. And I think that would work well from an operation standpoint because you your man in this belt filter press, you know, five days a week, six or eight hours a day, you can stand there and man, you know, make sure the SAF is running too. And, and, um, your polymer that I mentioned is going to be in the same building that's going to feed both the belt press and the SAF. Um, the current costs that we've presented have only got one SAF unit. We're going to leave space though for a second one in case there needs to be some redundancy in the future. And we had this conversation with the supplier of this unit. They do rent these things out. If you got in a situation where that SAF unit was giving you a lot of trouble, you needed to take it down for a couple of months to rebuild the whole thing, you could park a temporary unit there to handle your flows. So if there's space available for it, and the plumbing is there and all those things. So, um, Jason, yes. uh, did you, uh, are you proposing to do away with the existing belt press building? The existing belt press, I think, has still got some life left in it. Um, so I, the suggestion is to keep it operable as a backup unit. 
when yeah. your belt, the new belt press goes down. And someday, when you have completely abandoned that old belt press, we could park another belt press under this building. Okay. So the, the value of this new belt press is both reliability and also you can see in this picture here on the left hand side the dumpsters right now that existing belt press it it just dumps the cake on the ground and staff's got to pick it up with the loader and put it in a dumpster we're going to set this building up so that it can directly go into the dumpster and then your solids removal company can simply pick up a dumpster and leave an empty one there for you reduce some man hours and how often does that fill up with the new system how often do you think the um really it'd be about the same as it does now so i bet van can answer that about the same amount of time about one dumpster a day Should free up a piece of equipment for you too. You're dedicating a skid steer right now to move those solids around. That's the value in that. When you were describing that, it reminded it sounded like you were describing the SAF process. Mm -hmm. It sounds a lot like boiling stock because you know those bubbles bring all that nasty to the top that you could skim right. off. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It really is. There's there's a picture of the testing that we did in your packet. Um, page twenty three starts on page twenty two so that that picture on page twenty two there is a little what they call a froth generator it's a little mini saf froth generator that's the patented part of this technology is that froth generator um, and so that little wand, they, they stuck that in the beaker and they injected the froth and those air bubbles mixed down at the bottom of the beaker and it didn't take long at all for those solids to float to the top. And that's the picture on page 23. Is the solids at the top of the beaker. Is that mm -hmm. the unit that we need to keep the spare parts for? Yes, yes, there's a few moving okay, parts on it. Down. That, mm -hmm, sure would, sure would. And that equalization basin will give you the time to allow to make those repairs if you do need to replace a part. For because the flow is continuous. Right. Mm -hmm. So you can, I think there's enough space in the equalization basin if we set, up, set it up with the right amount of, with the right pumping volume in it that you could get a, a solid 12 hours storage in that equalization base and if something went down you could engine the motor is going to keep sending you flow but you don't necessarily have to treat it for about a 12 hour period mm -hmm. um, so we did present a phase one phase two option and there was some mention of that before and i think the consensus is it'll certainly be the most cost effective to build them both at the same time. If you did build phase one and not undertake phase two, it's going to be more expensive later to do phase two. Um, so there's the value in that. I think there's also maybe some value with costs being what they are, so unpredictable. Uh, we've, we've kind of taken two steps forward here and one step back, so to speak. We've saved a million and a half bucks or so over the overall project, but we've also been fighting in inflation. So there's probably about a 5% half million dollar inflation in these numbers. Since the last numbers that you guys saw, I'm not so sure that it shouldn't be 10%, but I've been told that on a $10 million project, you know, 5% is pretty safe. Um, so what I'm saying here, I guess, is we've got an opportunity to maybe, if we bid this whole package out, we could package the construction job to maybe cut couple of aeration basins and go into it with just phase one if prices became out of sight. You know, if your funding just couldn't support a construction bid a year and a half from now or a year from now that, or six months from now that doesn't, doesn't match what we thought it was gonna be. We've, I've just seen that too many times where everybody agrees on the price, go out, get the financing, bids come back in, and that's not my goal here. 
we always try to be as accurate as we can on these estimates, but they are estimates. So I think that's the value of a phase one and phase two is we can chop some things off the construction if it's too expensive. A quick question. Mm -hmm. So with these upgrades and these new additions, is this just predominantly due to AFNA's needs? Like would we need this, these upgrades without them? You need the solids handling upgrades without them. That's right. So we're at about, the city's share is about 75% of these costs. I mean, Anjan Moto's share is about 75% of these costs, and yours is about 25%. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. And the, the other value that's in this for the city is the septic haulers. We've still got that in this project. And so the septic demand in this county is continually increasing. And so you'll be able to handle twice as many septic callers as you're accepting right now, if not more. Okay. Are there any other questions or comments? Okay. Everybody comfortable? Uh, All right. Henley, could you, could you talk a little bit about how we're gonna fund it? Or would you rather do that at a later time? Thank you, Jason. Thank you all. Uh, I think council uh, has some options to consider in terms of funding, uh, depending on the scope and the, the dollar amounts. I think uh, it was probably within the last two or three months we had done it done at least a little investigation in terms of uh, interest rates and amounts and how it would impact, uh, particularly if we were to use uh, our sinking fund uh, through ad valorem. And we certainly have capacity, that's one avenue. You may wanna consider combining other projects with an issuance. Uh, the city historically has gone out probably every five or six years. Uh, we were able to keep our, our debt service close to what it had been. Uh, so we issued in, and help me Yvonne, but we issued in 2007, 11, 11, 16, and, and we haven't issued uh, anything since then. So that, that's an opportunity for council to consider, not only for this project, for others. I, I think that it's a little premature to, uh, at this point until we nail down more precisely what some of these costs are and the, the funding mix, but uh, that, that's certainly an option that's available to us. And uh, Jennifer uh, Ritter, our financial advisor, did say that that window she felt comfortable with, you know, six months, six, six months plus. She goes, I don't feel comfortable predicting a year out, but uh, she, that, that seems to be what, uh, what the bond market uh, tends to be uh, yielding at this point. Next item is a discussion and presentation from Mr. Keith Sled, Heart of Texas Defense Alliance. Good afternoon, Mayor, Welcome. Council members. The city staff. I uh, just want to give you a quick update kind of on what's going on in Fort Hood and our organization. If you will look at the next slide, please. Just a kind of refresher for this area. There's three counties that are considered the uh, Colleen, Temple, Fort Hood, metropolitan area, which includes Lampasas, Bell, and Coryell <laughs> County. So what you find in that area is about one in three of the citizens is either active duty, a family member, a retiree, or one of their family members. And that doesn't include people who may have served in the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, just one or two tours and then got out and lived in the area. So if you could get numbers for those that was accurate, you're probably closer to one and two. So it's a heavily military influenced area. And a lot of that is because of the Fort Hood and the draw to the facilities in the area and the quality of life that a lot of the communities have here as well. So our charter hadn't changed. Our council member, or I'm sorry, your representative of my board of directors, Clay Harrington still. Uh, so I appreciate you letting him help us and provide guidance to us as we go along. Uh, the numbers you see on here for population, that's 2019 census numbers. I cannot get, the, I have to have detail down to the city level and to a degree council or uh, census data, and they haven't released that for publicly yet. So I should have it in the next month or so. They were supposed to release it earlier this month and I did not get it, so we'll see. I think in the next couple of weeks. And I'll update these and the next time you see them, they'll be more accurate. But it's only one year old at this point. Next slide, please. So this just kind of shows you what we're working on. Uh, I'm not going to talk about all this. I'm going to talk about a few things. One thing that I did not include in here, but I will talk about, is Texas A&M University over in south side of Colleen. Uh, 
Sometimes people don't realize what a great resource they have. Mm -hmm. So the children in the area around Fort Hood, if they take advantage of the early college high school programs that many of the communities and the schools assist, school districts offer, can go over to CTC, which teaches the sophomore, I'm sorry, freshman and sophomore level courses, and then A&M Central Texas teaches the junior and senior. Uh, and I don't have the cost for LISD, but for Cove and Clean ISDs, a child who takes full advantage of that early college high school program, graduates with an associate's degree, goes straight to Central Texas College, or Central, I'm sorry, Texas A&M Central Texas, and can graduate in two years with a bachelor's degree at a cost of about $15,000. And that's not bad for a four-year degree from a accredited university. Uh, but a lot of times I think kids don't understand what their opportunities are and we collectively have to do a better job in informing them sometimes because that's a huge cost savings to parents. Not a lot of debt involved with it and some great degree programs over there. Uh, but that's just a list of the things we've been working on. If you go to the next slide, please. Uh, this is just to update you on the area. So if you look at land passes, you'll see there where it says 0.7% of your city population. is That's 0.7% of the 160,000. You'll see up there at the bottom line on the top. Uh, so you have just about 1,100, almost 1,200 people that is active duty retired or a family member of one of those two that live in the city limits. Uh, the county itself has another 3,600. So you've got just a little over uh, 4,400, 4,800, I'm sorry, that live here. You're going to see that number grow. Uh, for the clean Harker Heights area is pretty saturated with housing, and you're starting to see people move further and further out to get some of the smaller communities quality of life and also the advantages of living in those communities with cheaper costs, better housing in some cases than you can get in those two cities. Uh, and we've seen it about 1% to 2% each year in the last couple of years move out. So, and I'll have a better idea once I get those census numbers, I can tell you more about that. But you still have a large part of both your city population and your county population. So, you know, it's, that's 22% for the county, 40, almost 15% for the city that's active duty retired or in the military. Uh, if you go to the next one, please. So, a couple of things, and the numbers are going to grow. So, Fort Hood is going to get what's called a maneuver short range air defense battalion. It's an old air defense artillery battalion just with a new name. Uh, it's a function the Army took out of the force structure during the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, and they're now putting it back into the structure. So Fort Hood will get a battalion, about 550 soldiers, probably seven to 800 family members that will come with that. That'll be formally announced in the next year and start standing up in fiscal year 22. Uh, so you'll probably see some of those folks come over here looking to move into your community too as we go along. Uh, the defense budget, Congress, as you know, hasn't passed a lot of the budgeting bills due to authorizations or appropriations. But both of them right now include a 2.7% pay raise for active duty soldiers and family members, and then the Reserve and Guard guys get their proportionate share as well. Uh, we don't know when the bill is going to come. It's been in the hearings, and you all see the television news as much as I do about what, what's going on up there. They do expect they'll pass one, but it's going to be a continuing resolution probably till December. So uh, we do take a, have a program called... The net take, we take a group of about 10 people at a time out to the National Training Center at Fort Irwin, California. And Fort Irwin's a huge desert area. A brigade combat team, about 4,000 soldiers, goes out there and fights against another brigade that's stationed there, 4,000 soldiers. And they have a force-on-force -force battle using the Army's version of laser tag. Now, we take the folks out there to see that because you often hear the noise from Fort Hood. You see the soldiers in this area, but you never really get a chance to see what that unit does when it goes out to train. Uh, and so we'll usually take a group out on a Saturday, we go into the training area on Sunday, and then we fly back on a Monday. Uh, I look back at the records, and I have not seen someone from Lampasas go with that. But the mayor, city manager, other community leaders would like to go with that at some point. If you'll just let me know, I'll add them to the list. And what will happen is when we get closer, we have three rotations, March, April, and May this next year. A list will go out, and those people get an invitation to participate, and they'll get the details, and they can make that decision based on schedule or other things if they want to go or not. But it's a great opportunity. I mean, we've taken Glenn Hager out to the Texas Comptroller. Don Buckingham's been out. Uh, J.D. Sheffield, you know, the previous rep had been out. Uh, the current representative had been out. Uh, so it's just a great opportunity to kind of see what goes on and uh, have a chance to understand that better. Uh, the next thing I'll talk about real quick is the Base Renaming Commission. Now, I know the mayor and Mr. Williamson were able to participate in those community engagements. And so that's going to happen. I know some people were like, we don't want it to change. It's a, it's a federal law, so it's not a matter of if, it's only going to happen. 
uh, if you'll scroll up just a little bit more, the real thing, or, or I'm sorry, the other way, please, that bottom piece. That's what I want to tell you right now. They're taking community feedback from the public through 1st of December. The websites you see up there, the first ones are actual websites, and the second one is where you can go in and put in your recommendation for naming Fort Hood or any other installation that they're looking at and the reasons why you think it ought to be named that. Uh, and so we just want to share that with the community so they can all provide their foot feedback and input to it. Uh, hopefully they'll take the community recommendations when they make that decision, but we don't know what we'll see. They haven't announced how they're going to make the decisions. They have another two years to do it, uh, which they will fully take, being how it's in D.C. Uh, this one is just sort of uh, information. So recently there's a new technology for building houses that came out. It's called 3D printed housing. And if you had an old Hewlett Packard, for example, 3D printer, it works just like that. There's a frame that goes up and there's a bar that goes back and forth and lays out this foundation. It'll put out about a, you see those lines on the wall in the picture on the right. It lays out about a three inch concrete tube of concrete with special proprietary chemicals from this company in Austin. And it lays the entire thing out. It built a house in five days. Now that's not, you know, any of the electrical work being done, but that's the complete framing of it. Uh, they're looking at using it for barracks, well, especially for North Fort Hood for some of the transient barracks that we use for guard and reserves. But there's about 30 buildings in Austin that have been built with it. They built one out at Camp, uh, not Camp Mabry, Camp Swift, out on the east side of Austin. Uh, and it's going through approval right now. May I ask what the cost of something like that is? That one was cheaper than building the traditional construction. Plant. It is? Yeah, as it stands right now. They were doing the last punch list items when we were out there where they think the real cost savings is going to be is in the R values and what they're going to save on energy into heating and cooling it. Because wow. it's not just that three-inch wall. There's actually two walls with about a foot in between where you run all your conduit and everything else, and it's heavily insulated. Uh, the picture on the left is actually housing that exists in Austin now that they put up. They, were, they had just finished a house in Austin that they took us out to when we were down there for that trip. You may see more of this come out in the area as it becomes more wider spread. They're the only company that currently has, I think, the patent to do this. Uh, but it's just interesting because you may see some of that come around. And they have contracts with NASA to potentially do this on the moon and Mars if they ever get back to that point with that. Uh, there's a website link down there if you want to see how they built the barracks. And you can, they have a little video up that shows you how that little machine goes around and does what it's doing. Uh, the Fort Hood Fast Facts is the last thing I'll, I'll leave you with. Uh, our total numbers, you see it says 97,000 up there at the top has gone down about 2,500 in the last two months. And it's almost exclusively in family members. They can't find housing in the area, and so they're not bringing their family until they find a house. In that market over there, it's 60 days wait for a rental. And houses just to buy are hard to find. And so they don't want to live in a hotel for 60 days, so they'll leave their family wherever they were at. They'll come in until they get that to move it in. But it, that's the biggest impact we've seen from the housing crunch that's going on. Fort Hood's got, the deployment numbers are fairly low if you go down a little more, uh, about 1,929. Traditionally, it's about 6,000 a month. That will go up some this next month because there's an aviation brigade that's deploying to Europe uh, and a couple other places. And it'll go up again in the spring a little bit. But we think it's going to be lower overall, probably in the 3,000 to 4,000 range over the next years as they've kind of, we're out of Iraq, except for a small force, and we're out of Afghanistan for doing that. So some of that will be better. You have people have more time at home. Uh, subjects and questions you have, that concludes my presentation. And I appreciate your time this afternoon. Thank you for coming. Appreciate it. Next item. Discussion regarding the scope and the timing of the Hostess House Rehabilitation. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, this item has been placed back on the agenda per Council request, uh, primarily to discuss the design scheme for renovation. Um, it's, uh, although it was understood through previous meetings, uh, uh, written communication and review, we completely understand Council's desire to review. Uh, as noted, the proposal uh, that's included in your packet, which is basically uh, the same proposal that you had in your packet okay. last time, calls for the design, plan, specification, construction, administration, uh, as well as there is a notation in there on the timing of the design uh, completion, which includes the structural and MEP design, 
uh, in FY22, uh, with the con structural construction in FY22, and rehab uh, renovation uh, of the uh, complete facility in uh, first quarter of 2023. A couple of points to make, and then I'll turn it over to uh, uh, Mr. Naylor of uh, Reliance Architecture, but uh, both schemes uh, do call for an extension, one approximately 10 foot, one approximately 26 feet to the east side. Uh, on the balanced uh, concept, you do lose one uh, restroom fixture per uh, per uh, restroom on the uh, lower level, but you add one small restroom uh, upstairs at times, times two. Uh, you do have adequate HVAC O&M space uh, in, the, uh, in both designs. Uh, you do have storage in the function, more storage in the functional uh, or in the improved function scheme, uh, as well as added banquet space in the improved function uh, scheme. Uh, approximately 900 and, excuse me, uh, 594 square feet on the first floor and 226 square feet on the uh, second floor. Uh, and with that, uh, you know, staff is, uh, uh, be happy to entertain any other questions you have or take any uh, direction from council uh, on this item. And I'd, I'd turn it over to Antonio, and I don't know if Chris would want to, Chris and Vicki are in and out of that facility all the time as well. They may have some comment from staff as well. So we walked over there, or we drove over there earlier today, we took a look at the building and we walked through the plan. So are there any questions or anything I need to go through? I think Finley gave a good you know, synopsis of everything that we're looking at doing over there. You know, like we were talking about earlier, I had questions about the heating and air conditioning. Yes. And so I called um, the my air conditioning connection and they agreed that it did need the 20, you know, the 20, um, tons of unit of, of air conditioning, but one option, because if you're talking two 10 ton units, you're talking two huge units that very few people can actually are qualified to work on and only one person here in town. So it's possible to break that down into four or five tons instead of two tens. And then you've got the, the right air conditioning with a lot smaller space allowing for the storage. So you're talking about still 20 tons, but doing it with four or five ton units. Yes, sir. Because it would be cheaper um, in the future if one were to go out, then you would be still have like three running and it would be a lot easier to fix it because of the, the qualifications needed to work on a 10 ton unit. I mean, we certainly can look at that. Uh, I'll talk with my uh, mechanical engineer and just check with him on that one. But uh, if we're looking at the same tonnage, then I see what your point is, and we could look at some doing something like that. Yes. Anything else? Happy for the trip. Thank you. <laughs> All right. That's Thank it. you for coming back, okay. Antonio. Thank you. Council need to hear from any Chris or Vicky on this, or any questions for them. I guess, Chris, did we answer the question on the storage? That still bothers me. Uh, again, I think top priority has to be storage and restrooms on each floor, each level. I think it's a must. Uh, I don't know whether 10 foot's enough or 26 foot, whatever the deal is, but it has to have storage to accommodate tables and chairs for up to 100 people on each floor, and we need restrooms on both floors where you don't have to go out on the balcony to access the restroom from the top floor or vice versa from the bottom floor. Does that include a janitor's closet too? Yes, or? it does. Okay. Is that, I know we were talking that when we left over there, but does that meet what we have currently, meet the storage that he's speaking of? That's a lot of tables yes. and chairs. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Is there any way to use oh, sorry? Is there any way to use the balance scheme and also have additional storage? I don't think there's enough there for what we need. Now, of course, I'm not the guy that can put together these plans, but it doesn't look like it to me. 
Not with two 10 ton units, but potentially with Certainly four or five. Certainly not ton units, but you, you've got to consider also, and Antonio would be better at answering this, but you've got the elevator there, and then you've, you're going to reduce your restroom space with the, you know, with the balanced. I, I don't know. Personally, I like the 26 foot extension. I think it gives us everything we need. Anything else for Chris? Thank you, sir. You bet. Mayor and Council, there is a corresponding item on the on the regular agenda. Right. Take this up. Next item is discussion regarding the scope of the Campbell Park Pavilion. Mayor and Council, this is brought back at Council's request uh, from October 11th, and just you, you did approve this project, and you funded it in an amount not to see 200, exceed $200,000. It's staff's understanding that council wishes to uh, consider design options, primarily water catchment system. Uh, the pricing and scope communicated uh, in uh, our quotation called for a 60 by 100 foot uh, slab, and that would be, in, be inclusive even on that extension that wasn't under roof, uh, four foot excavation, four foot select fill. Um, the 60 by 80 pavilion, some security light, uh, again, uh, per the engineer's recommendation, four foot of select fill uh, and two 5,000 gallon rainwater uh, catchments. The total cost of that uh, proposal was $175,885. Uh, so about $175,000, which would be inclusive of that. Staff is certainly uh, open to hearing uh, what council's suggestion uh, is regarding options and uh, I, th I think um, may even have comment from from the public on this as well. Finley, I was just curious how, because you just said that the extended um, 20 foot would not be under the roof? That is correct. This is uh, when uh, staff, uh, Chris and I met with the LAFTA representatives. We were brainstorming about different options for storage and knowing that we did not need an 18 foot ceiling if we were going to use storage and then have some sort of uh, countertop space where we you know if there was an event they could plug in roasters on a dedicated circuit etc not knowing that felt like you know maybe the first step logical is let's go ahead and make sure that we have the foundation for it and then um, i think there was even discussion uh, at that meeting about the possibility of seeing if there's maybe some some trades that would also assist in meeting the city halfway in terms of putting you know we even if you, you probably have enough in excess now maybe you could go ahead and stub out uh, load center electricity some plumbing but um, hard to say w without actually getting into it if, if in, in, in uh, councilman morris was at that uh, meeting as well i don't that that if you have a different recollection I no that's absolutely right and in fact one thing we talked about with uh, with the uh, laugh to getting involved with some of those improvements and trying to cover some of those costs for since we'll probably be using that pavilion some so where it's not just completely on the city and, and I think that that kind of segues into that rainwater collection tanks because you know it's one thing I think is super cool um, however I've heard from some folks in town that don't feel that it should be wholly the city's responsibility to do that so I was wondering if there is any possibility of the community garden maybe having any funds that go towards that or I think there's some someone in the audience that might be able to speak to that if that's all right. <laughs> well, Janet's coming up. I was just curious uh, that last meeting it got bumped up to 200 and all I had on my paper was 170 some and I didn't know did that come from the stakeholders that you met with um, the LAFTA board members? The, the additional amount of money? Uh, I, not, no, ma'am, not to my knowledge. I not made at that the meeting. motion. I made the motion last time not to exceed two hundred thousand. Right, uh, Kathy had mentioned two hundred as a limit. I was just wondering why the uh, the committee, the LAFTA committee, hadn't brought that to our attention before. Hadn't brought what? I can't speak to that, Mayor. The extra money. 
The meeting with LAFTA was before the last meeting. It didn't happen between the late last meeting that we had and this meeting. No, no. It happened before our last meeting, and I was under the impression with my packet that you were only asking for the 175 with this piece of paper. I'm just curious as to why the committee didn't offer up that they needed the extra money when they were having their stakeholders meetings is my only question. Money wasn't discussed in the stakeholders meeting as far as I'm understanding. At of all. course, I wasn't invited to it, so. The, the amount of 175, I believe, was discussed at the meeting. Yeah, there was no there was no numbers that uh, when meeting with with stakeholders, there was no numbers discussed at all. Like in regards to what the left of board was looking forward with that, but we're also looking at this is a you know a city project. Granted, left does do most of the work in Campbell Park event wise, mm -hmm. but this is not a predominantly just a left of. No, 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 no. I I don't mean to infer that at all. I just was wondering. Where the 200 came from, I guess. That's what. Bennett, I'm sorry. Go ahead and tell us what you want to tell us. Well, it came to me. This you need morning. to talk a little louder. What down? I still can't hear you. Okay. Um, it came to me this morning, uh, speaking to Zachary's uh, um, question, that. We really want that collection system, you know. How can we make this happen? And I would like to propose that we, it was my understanding we talked about $10,000 that this collection system uh, would cost and y'all had a problem with that, that amount of money. Um, I'm a grant writer, I've written several grants last year and have been awarded those grants. Um, I propose that, um, that I write a grant or work on a grant to do at least half of that amount. Would that be acceptable to the, to the council? I'm sure you need to talk about that, but uh, um, I think it's doable to to perhaps get a uh, a grant. I've uh, looked up a particular grant that's offering to communities uh, between ten and twenty five thousand. Of course, I wanted in that grant to include a um, a pad to service uh, the handicapped who are uh, wish to garden and they are in wheelchairs and or can't bend over just so I, that was another part of the grant that I wanted to write but I could expand it uh, to include some of this water if y'all would be amenable to do half I don't know that I could get you know more than that I, I, maybe I could uh, I'll try and go for as much as I can um, but I I will need to have the uh, the dimensions of the, uh, you know, the, the proposed uh, uh, plan that you originally was a part of this plan, uh, so that I have the documentation to show. Um, but anyway, that's my offering. Uh, if I think you should try that and come back to us with some information, as I mean, long as the uh, the stakeholders have no objection. I, I have one comment. Excuse one moment, please. That wasn't your objection to get rid of it because you didn't want it around your uh, ability. You just didn't want to spend that much money. Yeah, because I, th I think that we're kind of throwing in like stakeholder as it, like this wasn't a LAFTA deal with, with the rainwater catch system. I just brought, made that comment myself. So we don't know how the committee feels about the rainwater? I, I, I'm confused. <laughs> I, I think that option was discussed with the LAFTA committee. Everyone thought it was a good idea. Right. It just, from talking to folks in town, there's been some problems with that or some concerns with that. And I just thought it was worth mentioning. To, to keep it or to let go of it? No, to, to keep it, but see if there could be some kind of joint venture on there. Okay, so you've got no, ob no objection. Excuse me. You've got no objection 
the rainwater catchment part being six hundred pavilion. But it's not just the left of pavilion, it's a it's right. A pavilion. But I think you were the one that made the motion to get rid of it. So I'm just asking. Well, well it wasn't just a motion to get rid of it. So we could discuss this more. We just discussed this more. There's a proposal. And Janet is going to try to find some money to, to meet us halfway with that. But if you told me or asked me for a decision right now, I don't know. I mean, we need to see if the money's available. We need That's to see what, what folks in town think. But even if the money is available, you guys are okay for having it out there. Oh, no one at Laughter was against it. Okay. Randy, I'm sorry, what did you have? I, I just I just would like to know and clarify to myself, I, I made the motion for the 200000 not to exceed 200000 and my understanding was it included the rainwater system in it. Yeah. So your motion was it's to within include that it was within that hundred and seventy five thousand right. uh, what I'm looking at, and I believe I was asked during the meeting to amend mine not to exceed two hundred thousand and I right. did that so i I think I heard though uh, Mr. Morris say to exclude the ten and that would give them thirty five no, I don't believe he did that no ma'am that that wasn't what happened what the reason that i requested Randy amend as a motion to 200 is because that's what we originally budgeted and it was just in case cost went up. It had nothing to do with not include the rain catchment system. Well, we've got the 200 and you're okay with the rainwater staying? That's what my motion was that I thought we approved. Was there that one was little... one rainwater or was there two? There was two 5,000 gallons. 5,000. Which I think is a is something that uh, the city needs to consider more often in some of these. Uh, that's, a, that's a source that uh, we need to explore. Yes. Sure we do. I, I totally, okay, so totally agree I think, with that. Um, I think if you go out and see if you can get some money, it would help everyone out, and mm -hmm. uh, otherwise we'll go forward. We would certainly take all the help. Let me tell you, it, it, it doesn't come immediately. No, uh, we're aware of grants. So. You know, but I, I'm thinking that if we have the um, have have the okay from from the board, right. the council here, to have it, then I have more of a um, uh, I have more clout when I go to okay. to uh, give them the uh, the details of it that I have the backing of the city council on that'll that. be great was it was it is was it my understanding if we if we approve the 200,000 that that was rainwater collection system the whole deal then then why would we be going and and getting a grant I don't remember that being part of the motion just because any money we can get it was not was it okay. it, it was not but I didn't know a grant was available I, I mean Obviously, we'd take all the help we can get, but, uh, yeah. uh, you know, if somebody else wants to participate in it. But I was more interested in having uh, the rainwater collection system as, as well as the, the uh, catering area mm -hmm. for, and the storage area that Zach had talked about. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm a big proponent of conservation and I think our resources are so important to look at, um, not just because we could really use it, but I think it's a perfect example for others to start to irrigate their, their landscapes, uh, take advantage of one, the beautiful rainwater versus city water. And there may be a time when we're coming up to a, um, a situation like the the West is dealing with now, where they have to change their whole way of uh, farming uh, to deal with the water shortage out of the Colorado River, as we saw on uh, 60 Minutes um, on Sunday. So, if we take the initiative and show people what can happen when you're when you're collecting your rainwater off your roof in your homes buildings, you know, and offset a lot of the expense that goes out in our, in our town for um, that, those uh, services. Um, yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. Thank Are you. we all good with this? Yes. Thank you. Mayor and Council, I might 
just ask for a little clarification. We, you know, we've been looking over, looking over the minutes. And of course, when there's a request made by council, regardless of a motion for consideration of a design, then I think it's staff's obligation to bring that back to you. And that's what we did. Uh, so we just want to be clear that, uh, and, and there's no, uh, this is a discussion item, there's no action, but right. we just want to be clear, would you like the design elements to be included on a future agenda, or would you like to go forward as specified, knowing that Ms. Crozier is going to uh, uh, seek uh, possible grant funding? And, I, and, and staff is happy to, to do whatever. If there is no clear consensus, we'll bring it back to you as an action item at the next agenda. I'm good with it the way it is. Again, you have approved the project, but I think the minutes indicate that there was some discussion over the design elements or the, the individual design elements that uh, uh, th there was a request for further discussion on. And the design elements meaning the uh, rainwater collection. No? Correct, as, uh, as opposed to uh, some additional improvements on the uh, storage area. I'm not sure everyone Whatever we at the need. meeting last time, I'm not sure everyone was under the same impression. Whatever we need to do to be legal. If we need to bring it back, then that's, I'm, I'm okay with that. I think there's a question we can bring it back. Uh, we will go ahead and uh, contract so that we can get steel right. pricing secured, et cetera. We'll, we'll do that. Uh, but again, we'll we'll bring it back to you at the next meeting. And I and I I don't want to beleaguer this, but um, when something's brought up like that, we want to make sure that council feels comfortable moving forward in in the, the precise direction you want to. And Finley, with the, with the design process, I mean, we can start the project and still cross that bridge down the road, couldn't we? Everybody good? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Next item is discussion regarding the review of element one through four, short-term goals of the comprehensive plan implementation. This is another long uh, workshop uh, agenda and I appreciate council's patience. We wanted to take another bite out of the, the uh, comprehensive plan uh, action steps and uh, objectives. Uh, we do have a few more in elements three and four that we, than we did in, in uh, elements one and two. Um, I also, in your packet, have included the slides from October 11th uh, for your reference. We did want to spend just a little bit of time uh, and give you the opportunity to uh, provide your comments to last time as well as this time. I think the... Um, If, if you look at the elements that make up uh, goal three and goal four, they are huge elements. They're, they are, they represent a major portion of your planning process, land use and development and economic development. Um, so there are, you know, as opposed to four that we looked at last week, there's seven or eight that we'll look at this week and we'll, we'll move through them. Um, we do want to spend some time and, and talk a little bit about the review, the implementation. Uh, also, your implementation may be based on how much money and how much staff resources you have to, to implement. Uh, whether you want to go out and hire a consultant to do your zoning regulations or uh, whether you want to try to amend what you currently have. Uh, so there are a number of options in terms of how we implement. The other thing that will happen is that once we get through next meeting, we'll have gone through all uh, six elements for our short term. I'm gonna combine, combine those into a list, so we'll take another look at them kind of in all one list, and that might be a little uh, helpful to you. In terms of uh, 311, uh, taking a look at, uh, this, this, is a, this is a big bite, uh, and I think a common theme that you will see in a lot of these action steps relates to community engagement. We cannot go out and do land use regulations or downtown plans or economic development plans without stakeholders' input. 
uh, we're short-sighted if we, if we try to do that. So a lot of the common themes that you'll see in these action steps is first and foremost, identify, assemble, facilitate a group of stakeholders. On our zoning regs and subdivision regs, this is a huge uh, step, but I think the first step isn't going out and hiring a consultant. The first step is gathering people together uh, and talk to them about what they think would be good in terms of land use regulations, what would be helpful, uh, how do we maintain uh, the latitude for mixed use and still maintain the character, which I think was a, another theme that came out of our planning process. Uh, if necessary, draft a scope, seek professional services to help us with that, procure for assessment and draft of land use regulations. Uh, short term uh, element 321, again this relates and actually you'll see my last action step as you incorporate this with the action steps on 311, but opportunities for mixed use activities and higher density residential uh, uses, uh, particularly in transitional residential areas. We're talking about areas just off key. We're talking about a downtown area, which you, you can't tell me it's not a mixed use area. And so why have we zoned that, uh, that the retail out, you know, the, the residential out of it when we have mixed use down here, but how do we continue to provide that opportunity but maintain the character? Uh, so again, identifying stakeholders, uh, business owners, property owners, residents from this area, facilitate, incorporate findings with 311. And so another theme that you'll see, particularly as we get into economic development, I think the element is almost a reinforcement of what we're currently doing. We have some expansion and, and some fine tuning to do, but, you know, establish a buy, uh, local campaign. You know, that's something uh, that, that we are already promoting, and I think a lot of the, the things in terms of the economic development, uh, you, you know, Mandy's doing a great job of. Local, by local campaign, stakeholders discuss the needs and desired outcomes, review and establish uh, elements of a by a local campaign, and then implement. Uh, providing, costs, providing opportunities for cost sharing of infrastructure improvements, and I believe that this uh, element came out of particularly the subdivision, where, in fact, we put that burden, burden on the developer really to start unless council because of return on investment, uh, because of other economic benefits, may, may decide, okay, we can do some electric, we can do something there, uh, we can do an incremental uh, cost sharing if that increment improves the city's uh, distribution center for, distribution system, for example. Um, I think we want to inventory state and federal funding sources, uh, talk to the city grant writer, see what like communities are doing in terms of successes and obstacles, um, take a look at our current subdivision policy related to infrastructure improvements, recommend revision if deemed appropriate. Right now it goes back to what we talked about on the pretreatment. You know, typically the starting point is those that receive the benefit should pay for that benefit. If there is some compelling reason not to that council decides, uh, based on return on investment or overall benefit to other areas of the city, you can do that. <clears throat> and the, and I, so all the action steps on this one is a maintain and continue. Th this is stuff that, that uh, Mandy works very hard at. Encourage expansion of existing businesses offering higher paying, high skilled jobs. Maintain a business expansion retention program. Uh, Maintain the visits to major employers. Talk, talk to them about workforce expansion market. Maintain and continue LEDC business training networking opportunities. <coughs> and there may be other action steps that we certainly would um, want to hear from council about and, and include. And I'm sorry I'm kind of running through this, but I'm trying to be sensitive to the length of our workshop agenda as well as our regular agenda. Establish historic preservation uh, guidelines. Um, again, this is uh, something that the first thing we do is we, we gather a group of people together. And um, this is something in Lano that took me two years to do. And this was month in, month out. It was a grind because you have to balance the, the needs, the wants, the desires of the people that own those buildings that you're trying to uh, encourage and promote a certain level of pre preservation uh, and you know it's got to be more of a carrot than a stick 
because the stick doesn't work a lot of times. So you have to find that balance, and that takes some facilitation and, and a lot of meeting and a lot of trust developed through those stakeholders. Uh, like communities, incorporate findings with the draft, uh, with draft development 311. So in a historic preservation design guidelines, that's a land use regulation, and in my opinion, that belongs, as, that, that goes through the same process as your zoning regs. It goes to the Planning and Zoning Commission, goes to City Council. Uh, expand options, and this is coincidentally what we're doing tonight. You guys are meeting one of your comprehensive plan goals tonight by uh, taking a look at options for expansion of existing pro properties such as a hostess house as well as long-range demand for a new conference center. Uh, again, uh, the action steps are kind of where we are right now. Assess options. We want to improve code compliance. Uh, procure design professional. Identify timing and funding, initiate construction based on council award, assess future needs related to conference and uh, conference meeting and event space, and then I have in parentheses there, that's more of a maybe a three to five year process, particularly as we take a bite of the hostess house. Uh, the next steps, and again, I, I apologize for moving through this uh, fairly quickly, but uh, we want to continue to talk about this. Uh, I do need to do some vetting with our current staff. Obviously, uh, you know, it'd be nice if I could sit down for three or four hours with a core staff group and say, okay, how do we as a staff tackle this? What are we doing? What do we need to add to it, et cetera? Uh, we want certainly to have your additional modification. Um, I think we will combine an implementation plan for you. We're not just gonna go off of slides. We actually want it in a spreadsheet. Um, I think the, the entire intent of this comprehensive plan is that you have a scorecard and you have boxes to check off. Did we do this? Did we do this? I think that's, that's the value and that's the intent uh, when you uh, made the investment in that plan. Uh, we would eventually come to you and say, okay, here's a list of to-dos. Here are target dates. Do you bless them and would you like us to improve them, change them, et cetera? Uh, probably within the next uh, you know, two to three months, uh, we would we would have this scorecard developed and, and say, okay, here's our first step. But I would certainly be interested in, in council's comment. I apologize for kind of rushing through uh, this. Uh, certainly would like to hear your input if you have anything from elements one and two, and then certainly I think uh, pretty, pretty major areas uh, of our planning process and elements three and four related to land use and uh, economic development. Comments, questions? Uh, I'm not sure exactly where to start because <laughs> this is a big, uh, yes. a big leap for us. But uh, one thing I, I I don't want to end up doing is is going through all these meetings and putting together all this and already be behind the curve, uh, so to speak, uh, in what we've. Uh, I, I think we need to incorporate with our core group the plans that we already have established uh, that we're trying to look at right now, such as the uh, business park and and the completion of that, the completion of our water and wastewater studies, uh, those things. As we improve those things, we got to uh, completely do this. I, I don't know exactly how we get into the uh, zoning other than with the uh, CIP committee, the Planning and Zoning Committee, and have a series. I see this as a series of meetings yeah. with all those entities, uh, as well as maybe others like economic development and so on. But I, I'm, I know it took you a long time in Lano, and, and it'll take a long time here uh, because we have a, a lot going on, not only us, but TxDOT and and other entities that are doing things. So uh, I think our initial meeting kind of, I, I don't want to swallow this like a 55 gallon barrel. I, I think we need to, to break it down and, and try to go through that as, as small as we can. Sounds good. With. Finley, we had talked about another planning session for the council Correct. staff. <clears throat> you got any ideas about a date for that? Um, I do not, I know that you asked me to to think about a date, and I have not had the chance to, but 
a, a comment based on the mayor, what the mayor is looking for, is we at January, excuse me, July 7th, we sat down as a council and we took a look at, you know, some things that were priorities to councils, particularly stepping into budget process. Uh, we took, you know, a half a day talking about uh, concepts for the hostess house and we spent half a day talking about pre-treatment updates and uh, what was important to council and I thought that was very valuable and we, we, we decided we had to stop it because we ran out of time but I'm certainly open to doing that. The other thing that I, I think I preached uh, as well Councilman Clark is you know hopefully we don't duplicate our planning efforts. Our comprehensive plan is one thing. Incorporated in that comprehensive plan and elements one and two is water and wastewater and upper pressure plane and, and how, do we, how do we handle pretreatment. So by doing some of these things, we're already meeting some of the goals of the, our plan um, by doing things like that. The CIP is a very valuable process. One of the things the comprehensive plan says is continue to can't do that. Uh, but that's another planning process. So we, we stack a lot of these a lot of this work on top of each other, but hopefully we don't duplicate much of it. And we certainly understand uh, Council's time is uh, valuable, but uh, Mayor, I'd be happy to, to take a look at a few dates, whether that's a Saturday morning or a, an evening sometime, something that con is convenient, to, uh, particularly you know for folks that have maybe a busier schedule. I think we'd all appreciate that. Yeah, Stanley, I wanna say thank you for bringing this up and, and keeping it before us. And, you know, one of the things I think we need to, to keep in, in the back of our minds that this is a one year, five year, 15, 20 year type plan. And, uh, and we're not gonna swallow this all in one bite, but it, but it does give us a, does give us a, a roadmap to where we're going. And as, as arduous and as, as difficult as it is, I. I, I think this is hugely important uh, with the direction that, that you and your staff are putting before us, and thank you. Yeah, I think Council's vision is very clear. It's, okay, now we've got this. You know, now, now we've got a, a road map, and we need to get on it. And uh, certainly uh, uh, staff received that message and, and uh, is very uh, respectful. We think it's a good approach. Thank you. Thank you, Finley. Next item up is discussion and presentation regarding the Chamber of Commerce third and fourth quarter reports. Ms. Melissa. Good evening, Council. I just want to start off by saying that Becky is passing out an explanation of some of my over budgeted items that were, um, I was negligent in um, providing that information and I took for granted that there are several new members on the council. So the reports that I've presented in the past, many of those council members have not seen those. And so um, this is just a little bit more detail regarding possibly the questions that might be um, asked of me this evening based on this report. Um, and we did go to a semi-annual report um, presentation. So I have a feeling that that lapse as well when I used to come quarterly um, re was reflected in this um, budget uh, report presentation. So um, I will go ahead and um, let you guys view that briefly, but if you have any questions based on the previous packet, um, I'll be happy to take those. I think uh, what would be helpful for me, I'll just speak for myself, sure. is that if your uh, CPA accountant, whatever you have, if they could run a report for utilities per se, you know, whatever account number you've got, just lump them all together. Okay. Uh, looking at your, your invoices, and that's really great that you've given us all this, mm -hmm. but I, I, I don't have the time to add it up and make sure that it's, it's sure. correct. So if you had something that showed all a of ledger. your account numbers in yes. one, on one spreadsheet, that would be helpful for me. Yes, I can provide that ledger based on those code items. Okay. I'd be happy to do that. And um, in discussing this with Mandy, um, I did do this for one report a while back. I think you um, did. Yeah. Where I did break it down. And um, so what I could do is I can do the codes on top of the receipts as a cover page, yes. possibly, and then also do um, a summary spreadsheet as well. I think that would be helpful because yeah. you do have a lot of receipts now that you're only coming. Uh, yes. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Semi-annually. Yes, Does anyone have any questions for Melissa? 
about the, the receipts or the expenses? I'm with you with getting more detailed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, that way we don't have to. And this is very and a little cool. bit easier to, to read. Okay. Everybody well, good? Whatever information you need, I'll be happy to present. And I, again, I do apologize for not expanding on um, those reports. I had taken for granted that I'd been submitting them um, with the documentation in the past. And um, I understand now that I do need to be a little bit more transparent um, in regards to the new council members as well. So. Okay. I'll be happy to do that. Okay. Any forward. questions? Everybody good? Thank you, Melissa. Thank you. Next item is discussion regarding the council city council workshop format. Thank you, Mayor and Council. This item was brought up uh, at really the conclusion of uh, last meeting's, October 11th meeting's uh, workshop agenda. Uh, it allows council the opportunity to discuss the forma, format of the workshop session. And I think the other thing that it uh, certainly uh, hits on too is communication, making sure that we're providing you enough information and communicating with you uh, as well as we possibly can, uh, particularly on more complex items. Um, we're certainly uh, sensitive to council deliberation and the need to fully discuss items. Um, however, we uh, want to make sure, I think, as much as anything else, is that council has latitude. And if something you don't feel comfortable with after you discuss it at workshop, and typically we won't put complex items on an agenda, on a workshop agenda, and then have, have it on the uh, regular agenda if it's in complex in nature. For example, and, and I know that we weren't ready to pull the trigger on the hostess house. You needed more time, and that's fine. But it is an item that we have been discussing for a, a good period of time. Uh, certainly, uh, we'd like to make sure that if council wants to take action, they have the opportunity to. And certainly, if you do not, uh, you can defer that to a future meeting. Uh, we also, you know, would... We've, we've done a couple of different things over the years. We've, I've had standing meetings with council members prior to council meetings so that they can come in and talk to me one-on-one -on -one about specific information. Uh, we've tried to push out as much information as we can, either through uh, an e e explanation, uh, email, or uh, other written materials, memos along the way, um, emails, manager's report. Uh, but obviously, I think the, the, the sign-off on everything that I send you is, if you have any questions, please give me a call. And we certainly want to make sure that uh, if you're like Councilman Clark, which it's, it's, more, it's more valuable for me to spend three different phone calls during the course of the day than to have... Or yeah, five. Or five. <laughs> uh, but, but, but there is value to that, and I want to make sure that that council understands that that door's always open. So if you don't feel like you have the details... And I know we've typically been trying to get the packet out. Uh, like before October 11th, the packet was out Tuesday before the 11th. And, but certainly, if you don't have time to get to it, we understand that. But don't be afraid to call us Saturday afternoon, Sunday afternoon, Monday morning on that. So a couple of things. Uh, in terms of the format, uh, certainly would be interested in hearing council's uh, uh, feedback on if you want to preclude any action item on a workshop item. In, on future agendas. Again, it's my opinion that council needs to have the latitude to make a decision or to not make a decision. Uh, but if that is the, the desire of council, uh, then we'd certainly, certainly honor that. It does tend to push things off, but uh, if you're ready to make a decision, we want you to give you the latitude to make a decision. I would prefer that we go ahead and put everything on the agenda because we do have the wherewithal as a council as Mr. Clark did last meeting, to say, I don't have enough information, I'd like to delay. We can put it off for uh, the next meeting, or if you know you're gonna get the, the information anytime soon, that can be accomplished. If we delay and don't put the item on the agenda, we're taking another two weeks to vote on it. Uh, and I, you were comfortable enough to I think, delay that, it I, seemed like. I think I, I may have, misled a little bit from the standpoint. 
I, I'm more concerned about the complex issues. And, and obviously, if there's items like uh, a, bid, a bid item where we did a, a vehicle or a trailer or such as we have tonight, uh, that, uh, you know, we go ahead and move forward with those. I think I was just uncomfortable that I didn't have enough time to deal with the complex issues that we had on there. Right. And, and if I've misspoke that, I, I apologize. I, I, it's just very hard on those major issues for me to uh, get straight in my mind everything that's going on with it, make some phone calls, and I was asking for more time on that. The normal agenda items are an emergency purchase that we have to do from time to time. I certainly would welcome putting it back on the agenda, and I apologize if I misled anybody. No, I, I it's the complex issue yes, that I was talking about. Then when we talk, uh, I talked to Finley, who gets to decide you know, what the complex issues are? I think if we put them on here, and then we have a council member that wants more time, it makes it much more efficient for us to ask for it at that meeting and then delay just the one item. That's fine. I, I don't have a problem with that. I have, I have always worked under the assumption, and Becky corrected me last time because I moved to, to table it, which you can't do. Uh, I've seen it done by councils in the past, but apparently well, that's we can not. Table. We can table, but it just gets moved to another. It, well, it just day. moves to later yeah. in the same meeting, so is we what I understood. So, so what I need to say is motion to postpone it to the next meeting, and, and I can deal, huh? I can't do that? No, no, it's take no action. Or take no action. Okay. Well, as long as you keep me straight on it, I'm, I'm good trying to move forward with this. It's, uh, I, I don't have a problem with putting everything on there for at least us to look at, but I don't also to have a problem with calling your Finley and saying this is very complex. Uh, I mean, I, guys, I called him five, five times today. Okay. Uh, I think we're all in agreement that that would work. And Mayor and Council, I would just uh, say again that um, we'll, we'll meet with you at the drop of a hat. So if you call us and say I'm 15 minutes out and I've got 15 minutes, we'll drop what we need to do and meet with you and discuss any, any questions you might have. Yes, everybody agreed. Yep. Thank you so much, Finley, and I will commend you for always being available. Um, so let me just ask, do we need to take a short break? Okay, so then I will say we're going to take a 10-minute recess. I need a motion to adjourn. Motion. Adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. he's not here great thank you okay next up is public hearing citizen comments any citizen who desires to address the city council on a matter not included on the agenda may do so at this time the city council may not deliberate on items presented under this agenda item and we have no one next item is citizen comments 
regarding any item that is on the agenda may do so at this time. No one? Thank you. 2.1, discussion and possible action concerning approval of the minutes of the regular meeting held on October the 11th, 2021. I didn't see any corrections. Recommend approval. Need a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. We have a consent agenda uh, regarding the 20, September 21 investment report. Recommend approval of consent agenda. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Building official monthly report is next. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Frank and I are gonna go over the presentation that we put together. Um, this is gonna be our annual report from October of 2020 through September of 2021. This is gonna give you a snapshot of our staff, and of course, if we're a puzzle piece, so you have to put us all together. So you have Frank Ellitz, the building official. You have Becky Sims, the city secretary, zoning administrator. And then you have Lupi Sharping, who's our newest addition. She's our administrative assistant. So I kind of want to give you a snapshot of our day. So we do a lot of educating, whether it's platting, zoning, land use questions, building codes, um, when it regards the minimum baseline standards, um, homestead exemptions. We have a lot of homeowners that want to come in and do their own home improvements, which is fine as long as they're homesteaded. Um, but a lot of that entails some handholding because a lot of them don't understand the code and don't know what they need to do to get their, whether it's electrical or their plumbing or whatever they're doing with their home to get it up to standard. So we do kind of do a lot of handholding, or I say, should say Frank does a lot of handholding and explains the process to them. Um, preliminary plan review. Um, a lot of times when people will come in with a napkin, as Frank will say, and they'll give us an, an idea of what they want to do, um, they want us to create what they want. They want us to be their architect. So we have to kind of back up a little bit and kind of define what our role is and what their role is and what we need to move forward. So we do a lot of um, discussion, a lot of consults. And then one of the things we do as well is utility availability, um, minimal concept plan. So um, a lot of times somebody will just say, they'll come in and say, I just bought this property, do I have utilities? Do we have electric or plumbing there or sewer? Well, I can't just send my guys out to a land lot out there with no markings, no stakes, nothing out there to identify where they're going. So I try to ask for a survey or something or go stake the property for me just to give me an idea of where it's at. Meetings. Um, we try to over-educate. We do a lot of on-site meetings um, to discuss the project prior to permitting. We'll do pre-con meetings with staff, the general contractor, developers, and trades. And then um, Frank will go out in the field and actually talk to all of the contractors prior to start date so that everybody's on the same page. Okay, and then inspections, um, pretty timely. We normally handle them the same day. Case-by-case um, -case basis, sometimes he's out in the field all day and he's going back to back to back to inspections. Sometimes if we can, we'll let him know that he'll be there tomorrow, but typically they're done within a 24-hour period. Um, sometimes we'll go back and do a lot of several re-inspections um, and we don't typically um, charge fees for that um, because a lot of it is just making sure that they're doing it right. So we wanna make sure that we have that relationship to where we do help them along the way. Um, sometimes that does become a punch list. So like a lot of times when they're going through there and like they're having a list of things that they haven't done, sometimes they'll kind of walk through the process step by step and say, okay, here's what I mean or here's what needs to be updated or here's where the code comes into play. So they'll kind of walk through that process as well. This just kind of gives you a snapshot of the total permits by type. So for the 12 month period, there were 676 permits that were pulled or issued. So this kind of identifies your electrical being 180, your plumbing 160, and then some of the trades will roll up to your building. So of the 54 building permits, you will have electrical, plumbing, mechanical will fall in there as well. So 
74 permits were issued via MyGov Permit Now. So this is the new program that we just started implementing in December of 2020. So this is still new to us. We're still learning it. We're still educating our contractors on it. So it's a, it's a work in progress, but it, we are making progress. This is your permits issued by month. So you can see how it fluctuates each month just depending on what's going on. Um, so it just kind of starts in October at 77, and then this last September it went down to 54. But you can see the drops, like in February, of course, when it was really cold. <laughs> we didn't get nearly as many permits issued. So of the residential remodel addition permits, I kind of want to break this out for you as well. Um, of the 103 remodel addition permits, 25 were roof permits, 34 related to sheds, carports, slab work, workshops, garages, and then 19 related to just to interior residential remodels. So of the 54 building permits, 47 of those were new homes. And this kind of shows you some of our actual builders that we have out there that are building homes. Um, we have Stone Valley, Brody Estates, um, RKJ Construction, Tom Lancaster Homes, Far and Far, and then Hillside Acres. Um, I will say that um, Brody Estates, we've actually done four permits. We've got two that are completed. I think two. Two of them have been completed, and then we have two that are recent, um, just issued permits for within the last few months. Um, Stone Valley, I think we have maybe 15 left to build out there of the 68 we started. So we're pretty close to finishing that subdivision. And then on Hillside Acres, we've actually issued four building permits for that, for new houses. So it's moving right along. So we had two new duplexes, and then we had five commercial buildings. So this identifies our five commercial buildings. So we had Sefco that we issued this year, Waterburger, the Sneed Crematorium, the High School Auto Tech and Ag Building, which is actually getting started now, and then the Community Church. So this kind of average shows our inspections by month. So we had 763 annual, so the entire 12-month period, there were 763 inspections that Frank went on in the field. That averages about 63 per month, three per day. But of course, some days are going to be heavier, some days are going to be lighter, and it just kind of depends. But this kind of shows you um, kind of a snapshot picture of what he does throughout the day, which is very minimal compared to all the consults he does in the plan review and the meetings he has, and so it, he stays very busy. So this just kind of gives you a snapshot of the new businesses that happened over the 12-month period. So we had Alamo Coffee, Nextlink, Golden Chick, Pizza Works, which has just now recently been open within the last two months, I would say. Um, Reaching Greatness is the vapor um, shop over there by the shoe department. Um, Whataburger, Emma Law Engineers, the um, Sherry Shop, which is a thrift shop down on um, 3rd Street, down on the square. Um, I'm sorry, 4th Street, sorry. Um, the Dog House, um, Wild, Hearts, Wild Heart Saloon and Boutique, and then Bohemia Salon and Spa, which was, um, they just put in a new salon at the same location. <coughs> So planning and zoning, so for this last year we had nine meetings, 14 public hearings, which resulted in 160 certified letters that were sent out to property owners. The types of requests, we had five rezone requests, nine specific use permits, and then two plat approvals. Zoning board of adjustments, we only had one meeting this last year, which normally we have two per year, so we're slacking. And we had one public hearing and then we had 24 certified letters for that one case. So types of requests, we had a reduction in lot size from 6,000 square foot to 5,400 square foot. And then we had a reduction in lot depth from 110 to 103. And that was on the same property. <clears throat> this is a list of all the adopted ordinances that take place relating to building and planning. I'm not going to read them all to you, but this just goes back to the planning and zoning meetings that we had. And then this is what will go before y'all for y'all to adopt those ordinances. Um, this is something that I thought was important, um, kind of identify the difference between a zoning regulation and a building code. Um, so like the city of Lynn Passes, zoning regulations were actually adopted in 1999. Um, the zoning regulations are designed to regulate land use inside the city limits, which includes residential and commercial uses. Zoning regulations are amended via ordinance with recommendations from the planning commission adopted by city council. The building codes are adopted by ordinance. The adoption of codes can include city amendments. 
These set the minimum baseline standards for new construction and existing. Currently, the city is under the 2012 IBC, which is the International Building Code, International Residential Code, International Plumbing Code, the 2014 National Electric Code, and the 2015 Energy Code. We're currently in the process of adopting the 2021 Building Code and the 2020 NEC. This is something you'll have a corresponding item on on your regular agenda. So we had our town hall meeting September 16th, and then we had our construction board meeting on October the 21st. Comprehensive plan, these are items that I brought up to kind of present to you with regarding specific to the building and planning side. So the short-term goals, the one to two years, was to strengthen the enforcement and incentives throughout the city to maintain the quality of neighborhood character and renovate older structures in disrepair. Undertake a comprehensive analysis of the city's zoning, subdivision, and other land use regulations and consider opportunities for improvement, provide more consistency, clarity, and compa compatibility with existing uses. Identify opportunities for mixed use activities, higher density residential uses, and transitional residential areas near downtown, silk stocking row, and review and amend the zoning regulations to facilitate these activities. And then establish historic preservation design guidelines. So these are just the short-term goals that we'll focus on within the next year or two. Any questions you may have for either of us? And I'm gonna let Frank talk too. <laughs> Anyone have questions for Frank? A co couple of questions. How, when you go apply for a building permit, how much does the city charge for a building permit? It varies on the type of permit you're going to be issued. So, like, for example, if you're doing a residential remodel, it's $100. Okay. If you're doing just an electrical upgrade, it's $35. Um, if it's a new house, it's $55 for electrical. Commercial is 100. It just really varies on what project and the scope of the project it entails. Um, residential, they normally have more flat rates, whereas commercial is based on either square footage or the um, construction costs. So it's um, $5 per thousand. Um, starts at 25 and it's $5 per thousand going up from there. Okay. So if you're building a $100,000 house, it'd be $500. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Something like that. Yes. And was that on the, on the comprehensive plan, did that come from the comprehensive planning that we did earlier? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes. And back to residential, though, residential is based on square footage, so not on the cost of the house. Yeah. Usually statewide. Yeah. Okay. And, That's and, why residential is flat rates versus commercial. I have three small comments. One is I've spoke to y'all before, and I mentioned it again tonight, in regards to the uh, finding the lot corners, in regards to the public right-of-ways, the survey or whatever uh, that we used to do, I understand that, that there's been some concern about that. Uh, I, would like, I would like for that to be satisfied in the near future with the council uh, in regards to an amendment or whatever we've gotta do uh, to do that. The second thing is how much time are you having to spend on doing punch lists for developers? Well, to answer your first question, the uh, form survey was brought up to the construction board and it was tabled due to some questions they had. Uh, however, I'm a strong proponent of it and I believe it's really the only way to get an accurate idea of the location and avoid overlaps, PUE encroachments, setbacks, et cetera. Sure. Um, I'd look forward to that addressing that as soon as possible as well. Um, what was the other question? How much time do you spend in regards to trying to do punch lists for uh, contractors? Because I know I've been through that. And it just it's it's dependent. If it's too bad, if it's too far along, say if I fill up a list, then. I don't get into the house, then I stop the inspection at that point and move on to something else. Most of the time, they are pretty diligent about it because they want to move to the next phase of the construction. I would almost recommend that if we're, if we're going to do punch lists that we charge a re-inspection fee. Absolutely. For your time. Uh, that, and, and I did ask Frank, this is for the council as well, 
somewhere between the first reading and the second reading, I'd like to know what the changes, the major uh, component changes are between the 2020, uh, 2021, and the previous that we've had, just so council has an idea of what's going on. Several of us attended that town hall, and, and it's pretty extensive, but Becky can probably provide you with Well, I think Frank has a list already, and I, if we can just type that up and put it in our boxes to kind of give us an idea, I think that would uh, certainly satisfy my questions in regards to it. Absolutely. It's kind of compounded by the fact that we're three code cycles out. Sure, and I understand that, uh, and I think it's important to upgrade those as well. Uh, I just was concerned about the new components. Sometimes they get less restrictive, sometimes they get more restrictive, it just varies. Uh, and and I would just like to, just to cover the major points, I wouldn't expect you to try to cover everything. A ab absolutely, and I'll be happy to go over just a little of that right now. And a lot of that is basically in the descriptions, such as uh, tiny houses and puzzle rooms, and et cetera, are addressed in this code cycle. Um, also container houses, and that's stuff that just wasn't addressed in previous code cycles, so it really gives us kind of a, a delineation to go by with that. Uh, previously also uh, labs were considered uh, to have med gas in them, even though they didn't have med gas plumbing running through them, and that's all part of the rated uh, uh, hallway uh, system, the membrane that goes through there. Uh, it, it's Most of it really makes it a lot easier to, to get definitions for stuff and it, it also becomes a little bit more laxed, especially for occupant loads, et cetera. I think the commercial side of it's making it a little bit easier on, on people that are doing small businesses downtown. And, and that's fine. Uh, if you could just put that list in our boxes, somewhere yes, in between first and second reading, I'm good with that. Anybody else? I Actually, I'm sorry, really really quickly, I don't want to interrupt you, okay. but I will tell you that I will provide everybody with the same slideshow presentation that we did at the town hall and for the construction board. It's about 40 slides. It goes over a very detail of everything that was modified from the 2012 to the 2018 and then some of the 2021, and it shows all the significant changes. Um, because, like I said, there's a lot of changes, but just like Frank was saying, it's a lot of clarity, a lot of definitions, a lot of things that were added. Um, Thank so, you. That would be sufficient. And that way, it'll have everything for you at your fingertips. But Thank at you. but when we did go to the construction board, they were okay with it, and they understood as well as the town hall. The contractors that were there were in favor of it as well. I, do, I don't want to delay the first reading of the ordinance. I just would appreciate the the the, the knowledge. Absolutely. Thank you. I was going to ask Randy, how do you how do, how would you address the uh, you know you ask him about the the property lines and those those types of issues? How? Normally, it should be done by survey, staking. Uh, they've asked for more clarification, I guess. And, and that's part of the issue. And I think the comprehensive plan is going to address a lot of that with development standards. So, say if if uh, curb and gutter were required to give us something to pull off of. If you have a sloughed off piece of, piece of concrete, and the Councilman Clark and I spoke about this about a year or so ago, um, with, without an actual form survey, there's no real way to know. I mean, you can put lines up between the uh, pins on a survey, but those pins can be moved. Right. Yeah, I just get concerned that we're encroaching upon easements, right of ways, those kind of things, if we don't have that for him to do it. There's no way for him to sign off on it if he can't. If you can't tell how far of a right away it is. Uh, I agree. Almost all uh, local municipalities require that. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's an oddity that it's not happening here. Mm -hmm. Anything else? One more thing, just really quickly. Um, with regarding to the construction board, um, they did ask for additional information with regarding to surveyor availability and cost for the form survey, and they were okay with me sending the information via email, so it would not hold up our process moving forward. I just told them that I would be happy to oblige them and let them know what, what, they, what I found by researching it. But just to answer your question with regarding to setbacks, when we get our plan, I mean, I'm sorry, when we get our um, site plan when we do build houses it has like your 25 foot setback in the front six on the side six in the rear when they go out there to inspect that there is no markings that show that they're meeting that requirement specifically but a form survey would show that and that would be something they would have to deliver to the inspector on site at that time and that's what we're trying to do and how do you do that with a pre-existing building the form survey is I mean, 
That would basically be only on new construction. Okay. I mean, and, and there's times, you know, if you have something out in the middle of two or three acres, there's no real need for it, in my opinion. But it, when you have these uh, subdivisions and stuff has 10-foot lot lines and setbacks and PUEs and stuff that that could easily encroach, I mean, it's a... Uh, but this you, happened before. We've had overlaps and encroachments in town, and it's just something that needs to be addressed and cleaned up for the homeowners themselves. Right, right. right. Uh, on a remodel and addition would be a prime example as far as the setback requirement. Any yeah, other in, questions? In fact, at a, at a future date, I'm sorry, <laughs> if a uh, homeowner decided to uh, do an addition onto their house and they had that form survey, they wouldn't need anything else because they could measure up directly off of the slab itself. All right. Thank you. Thank you both. Frank, I'm glad to hear you talk finally. <laughs> Next item up is the city manager's operational report. Mayor and Council, I'll be brief because I know Mr. Naylor would like to get home by bedtime. Uh, so I'll try to buzz through my report. Just to let you know, uh, we did uh, execute a release allowing tech stock to enter on and occupy city property during the 281 improvement project. That's not only uh, for their construction purposes, but it's also to construct improvements on city property in terms of sidewalks and pedestrian access, driveway. SEFCO, uh, I believe Frank has uh, uh, the final, has, uh, signed off on the final inspections. I think we still have a CO to go, Frank, is that correct? End of the month, so uh, historic marker. I think council maybe uh, maybe you've already forgotten that we did apply for a um, a registered Texas historic landmark. That's a, that's a medallion. That's the not just a subject uh, area plaque, but the the uh, designation of this particular building. Uh, we found out that the, actually the state has added one more process. It's still a go, but I think we're also waiting because the State uh, Historic Commission only meets on a quarterly basis. So that, we expect, will be forthcoming here in the next several months. Construction Board, I'm not really going to talk about that because we, uh, the, the point I was making that uh, was what you just heard about in terms of the foreign survey, we started gathering public input on this uh, uh, right before COVID hit. We actually had a town hall meeting scheduled. I believe it was a form survey and our landscaping. And we ended up canceling that because of COVID. And we, I guess, mostly wanted to let you know that we haven't forgotten that. And we wanted to, to pick that back up. Uh, see, just a big thanks to Monica and uh, Christy and Kelly Sanguinette uh, for getting that CGIS uh, certification, CGIS audit. Uh, we are in compliance, as we always are. And it's, uh, it's not by accident. It's by the hard work that those folks put into uh, making sure that we have a secure and reliable network. <coughs> Milfoil, I think, um, I believe uh, Randy or Chuck asked me how the Milfoil was going today, and I said, well, I, I need to double check with Chris. Chris says it's a good result. Uh, we, rather than three, once they got that creek down and took a look at it, they said, well, we're going to need a fourth, which is fine. We'll be happy to... To, to deal with the fourth application, but one, two, three sections, and then the spot afterwards. So um, hopefully that'll uh, uh, offer a, a solution to that issue. 580 irrigation, just to let you know, we're expecting back-ordered parts to be available and uh, to be installed in November, first part of November. <coughs> I will say that uh, we, we were aid, aided on those fields by uh, the overall turf health as well as the uh, timely rains. Um, I remember when I first got here and walked those fields, uh, they, they, were, they were hard as a rock, uh, difficult to play on. I, you know, as a, as a, as a former uh, soccer player, I don't know that, you know, that wouldn't have been an ideal surface. Uh, after we re received the call and the concern, you know, we went out and walked those fields, uh, all of them, and uh, uh, they're soft, uh, good root health, so I think the the regiment that uh, they have employed out there in terms of aeration, fertilization, um, uh, watering is, 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 really, uh, is really paid off, uh, even though we did have an issue uh, with our irrigation here for the past uh, number of months. Engine one's out for about 30 days. We're sourcing parts for a uh, bad head gasket. 
uh, Rescue One. Ladder One is a primary response apparatus with Rescue One as a backup. And uh, just to let you know, Chief Smith has already done uh, the initial investigations for a, a replacement engine. Uh, EDC, and I don't want to take anything away from Mandy's report, it's always a good report. Please, please thumb through that because it gives you a good idea of what's happening in terms of economic activity around town. Uh, but I, I did want to point out that uh, uh, there was a downtown meeting, in fact, this morning, October 25th. It included the building official and other staff members. Um, about construction upgrades and how do we get things done and that, just a number of uh, items were discussed. And just to let you know that this is one of the things that addresses one of our goals on our comprehensive plan. <clears throat> uh, Sammy reports the tentative date of December 6th for the community lunch. Is that still? And uh, so if you want to jot that down on your calendar, it's always a good time to fellowship and uh, uh, bring in some toys or dollars for uh, the uh, toy, Christmas toy distribution through the volunteer department. Uh, fire department, uh, and, and again, per council budget priority, Chief Smith has modified his organizational structure uh, to include uh, duties for three additional personnel under the title of deputy chief. These are not new people. These are new positions. These are people that existed. We're just adding responsibility to them. Uh, to include uh, uh, J.P. Harris, uh, the uh, administrative duties as well as fire marshal duties for, this, for the city and department. Uh, Joe Adams, additional administrative and reporting duties, and uh, Corey Griner, operational and command duties. And uh, we'd certainly be happy to provide you with further descriptions of the duties uh, if that is helpful to council. Website, we are gearing up towards an upgrade. Uh, this happens every five years, Monica. Four years, we get an upgrade uh, through Civic Plus. So uh, Monica has been working hard on copy and content, as well as uh, Mandy has also been assisting. And uh, they plan on kicking that off, uh, even though they've already started kicking it off with Civic Plus representatives November uh, 8th. And we do know that and, and want to acknowledge that we've gotten some feedback from council regarding the website. And uh, staff will be reaching out uh, to you regarding any upgrades you might have. Uh, suggestions on. Squared Silly, October 30th. Don't miss it. Uh, we've been curtailed a little bit because of COVID over the past years, but uh, looking for good uh, public participation this year. And it's always, uh, never want to miss an opportunity to thank the folks at Vision. They do a great job and uh, spend a lot of time on, on our community. Water, uh, just to let you know, I don't have any uh, summary information as of this time, but we are keeping an eye on a couple of items. Uh, one is the recent uh, uh, allocation or a re recent additional reservation by the city of Coppers Cove uh, for water for their community. We wanted to double check and make sure which straws are pulling that water, where is it coming from, and also the calculations for capacity uh, that provide that. Uh, WCID, of course, just opened their new plant on Stillhouse. I think they'd previous, their previous plant is still operational on Belton, uh, but we do want to know uh, just make sure we keep our ear to the ground on that. Uh, additionally, we are continuing to make uh, a review or s seek some additional, probably dated information that we already have related to Sulphur Creek permit number 2971 that has a priority date of 1914. 19, that, that, that priority date is golden. I don't know how many more senior rights there are on this tributary, or, or frankly, on the Prazos River. But 1914 is typically when people started obtaining these rights. So that, that's a very important uh, right, and we will also uh, continue to take a look. That's 3,760 acre feet. Like I told you at the last meeting, our annual use in 2020 was not quite 1,600 acre feet. So we want to continue to take a look at that and see what options there may be for that. Want to also recognize employees who began their career with the city of Lampasas in October. <coughs> Brandon Kepler, 11 years. Mike Blair, 11 years. Tom Zimpel, 11 years. Tyler Gillis, 8 years. Sawyer Smith, 5 years. Jesse Acosta, 15 years. Larry Wilson, 9 years. Jared Payne, 5 years. Van Sims, 11 years. Will Sneed, 6 years. William McC McYoung, 3 years. Lane Lewis, 2 years. Becky Sims, 11 years. Sammy Bailey, 33 years. J.P. Harris, 23 years, Brian Hall, nine years, 
Dustin Roscoe, three years. That's all I have to report. Thank any you very questions? much. Anyone have any questions for Finley? Thank you, sir. Mayor's comments. I did just want to say congratulations to LAFTA. Uh, they put on a tremendous fundraiser uh, last Saturday night. Just wanted to say congratulations to your board. Everything was great. They, they did a really good job. And also thank council for being so diligent this go around and hopefully we can get through some of this stuff. Uh, we have no unfinished business. New business, 7.1, discussion and possible action regarding the award of design and specification contract with Reliance Architect for structural remediation, renovations in addition to the hostess house in an amount not to exceed $130,570. Uh, Mayor and Council, this has been discussed, uh, this workshop as well as uh, at a uh, uh, get together over at the hostess house previously, it's also been obviously on our discussion uh, uh, agendas for a number of months now. <clears throat> what council is considering here is the uh, proposal, uh, not flat fee, not to exceed 135, for design construction admin for the uh, improved function. I did not ask Mr. Naylor to give us another proposal because we need to decide what scheme we want first, and then if, if it is the balance scheme, then we would have him pr provide us a proposal for that. But uh, if for some reason you do not want the uh, improved function, then make that known and I will seek a proposal for the balanced, uh, balanced floor plan. And I, I, Mr. Naylor asked if he could go or if I need, needed him to stick around, I said, well, why don't you stick around just in the event we do have any questions. So I appreciate him uh, sticking it out and uh, certainly I'm available for any questions. We need to have a motion and then we can discuss. Does anyone want to make a motion? Recommend approval. For? 130,570. Finley had asked us to designate. Designate for the improved. Improved. Does everyone understand that? Approved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Are there any questions or concerns? Yes, I, I think that, um, in my opinion, I think that I'd rather go with the balance scheme because I don't, I don't think the, I think that by ch moving the air conditioning from the two 10 ton units to five, five ton units is gonna give the storage that's necessary. And I don't, I don't think the additional $300,000 is worth the additional space. Any other comments? We have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Nay. Two opposed? Did you get that, Becky? Okay. Next item is discussion and acceptance of the Chamber of Commerce third and fourth quarter reports. Melissa was here earlier. So this will be the last time that I come for the fiscal year in regards to that report, and I won't be seeing you all until April again. And so I just wanted to let everyone know that if there is any additional information that's needed, um, please uh, contact me in regards to what we're doing over at the Chamber. Um, you had mentioned before that we are a visitor center, and so all of the reports that you receive from the city, we work in tandem. Um, on, on all those projects, and we do a lot of referrals um, to new um, homeowners and, and things of that nature. So while they can call the city, I mean, the chamber and the visitor center are really the first stop for a lot of people. So yes. um, we do appreciate the support that the city gives and working with Mandy on um, some different business um, and tourism items it has been a pleasure. So we hope that that continues as well. And we will also be doing um, a new membership campaign. I know that there's been some questions in the past about the benefits that members receive and so forth on a chamber side of things. And those will just help to reinforce tourism and the business community um, in Lamp Passes to make it a destination as was mentioned earlier. So again, I have a lot of information that I could cover. So if that information is ever um, requested, please just let me know and I can um, relay that in Great. a meeting or on the side. Great, so. thank you. I, I just have one comment. 
Yes. If we if we get to a uh, wayfinding before then, I'd like to make sure that she's in attendance. Our wayfinding ordinance and our discussions on that, just so she's invited, because I think she can help us a lot in advertising it. And, and just to note, um, I am working with different nonprofits on some holiday events, and so we're working in tandem on that. But in regards to the comprehensive plan, that is something that I'm very passionate about, and I have sit in on, sat in on some of those meetings. Um, wayfinding is another passion of mine because, again, we are the first stop for, for a lot of people, tourism exactly. and, and local. So, right. uh, Could I get a motion to accept the third and fourth quarter reports? So moved. Have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you, Melissa. Thank you very much, Council. 7.3, discussion and possible action regarding the award of East 3rd Street Roadway Improvements contract to Gage and Cade Construction, LLC, in the amount of $368,207.50. Meeting Mayor and Council, uh, I'm uh, sitting in for Carlos Garcia, who's somewhere in the Laguna Madre chasing redfish. Uh, these bids were uh, opened, advertised September 10th, opened on October 12th. We did receive six uh, bids. This is a, this is a project that uh, I think everybody has been waiting for, and uh, we were waiting for the alternative for Western to Live Oak. We had trouble getting uh, survey information and things like that, so we went ahead at Council's uh, direction and bid this. We did receive six bids. Low uh, bid was $368,207.50 from uh, Gage and Cade Construction. You do have in your packet the engineer's recommendation. Uh, just to give you some perspective, I think the estimate on this project was on the order of uh, 550 to, to 600,000. Uh, <clears throat> this kind of bucks the trend of what we have been seeing, but uh, uh, we would recommend uh, your approval and allow us to move forward on this project. I would like to proudly move forward and, and make a motion to approve to Gage and Cade Construction LLC in the amount of $368,207.50. Second. Have a motion and a second. Are there any other comments? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. And I'm saying yay, Finley. <laughs> uh, 7.4, discussion and possible action regarding the award of a quote to Holt Truck Centers in the amount of 33,579.56 for a 40,000 pound carrying capacity haul trailer. Mr. Good Sims. evening, Council, mm -hmm. Mayor. Um, this is a new trailer. Our excavator that we have right now weighs in excess of 18,000 pounds. Um, and it's, I'm sorry, the trailer we have right now carries only carries 18,000 pounds and the excavator uh, we have it weighs a little over 25,000 pounds. So for safety's sake, um, we need this trailer. Could I get a motion to approve this trailer? I would move to approve. Second. I have a motion and a second. Are there any comments or questions? I'm just curious, this was a budgeted item or a non-budgeted? Yes, this is okay. a budgeted item. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you, Van. We're going to uh, defer 7.5, so I'm going to 7.6. Discussion and possible action regarding the purchase and installation of a new SCADA computer and an HMI upgrade in the amount of $40,530 from Track and Troll. Good evening. Um, again, this is a budgeted item. Um, after having so much trouble during the, the freeze of not being able to see our water situation, uh, we discussed this with our uh, provider, and this is the, the best possible action, is an upgrade to the entire system. That way we can log on and see it real time uh, versus not being able to like we do now. Need a motion to approve this? 
So moved. Recommend a second. Got a motion and a second. Does anyone have questions or comments? So this, there was a system put in a couple years ago, the same system? We've had, we've had uh, Wonderware, which is the system we have now, for almost 11 years. Okay. Um, it's becoming obsolete. Wonderware is actually moving out of the water in the wastewater business, and it's moving more into the factory, the large factory uh, such, uh, uh, type scenarios. Uh, the VT, SCADA, what we're moving to, is actually more designed for the water and the wastewater industries. So the current, so SCADA, what does that stand for? Sorry, babe. It's acquired data management, basically. Is that just the software or also the computers? It's everything. It's everything? Yes. And when's the last time we had an upgrade on that? We've we never upgraded. We had to change computers back in 19. Uh, our computer was one of the ones that got hit by the virus deal. But we have never actually upgraded the system. Not, uh, not the particular SCADA. And that's been around for a long, long time. Right. And uh, uh, the track control is a very good system. Yes. I would so, highly recommend it. So with this proposal here, that's going to be able to, to allow you to monitor each different meter. So real time. Th this isn't this isn't a water meter based. This is only our tanks and wastewater plant and water system. Okay. It also motors, allows our. Motors. It also use. allows for our inflow coming from, from Kempner as well? We piggyback off of Kempner's signal at both meter sites, so we see their pressures, we see their flows, and then we see elevations at both of our tank sites. We can control pumps at the Spring Street pump station and turn on and off. Um, if an emergency arises, we need to open the valve at Spring Street to fill the tank or close the valve if we need to. There's a lot of advancement we can do uh, inside of our system, we just do it a little, little bit at a time. Uh, we can see our lift stations. Uh, we can't control them yet, but that is an option. Um, it just costs a little bit of money every time we want to do an actual uh, system upgrade, not a SCADA upgrade. And so that we get some, what all benefits, I guess, I'm trying to get out of, or this trying to get, like what benefits are we going to get upgrading right now? The, ben the biggest benefit we're going to get from moving to VT SCADA is being able to view at home what's going on in our system. Which would come in handy like if yes. we had another winter yes. weather event. Okay. Right. Cool. Now, uh, there was a small issue with power. You know, of course, everybody other than Kipner, they could see their stuff because they weren't losing their power. So when we put our generators at 190 and 580 to power it up, we still couldn't see it. They were able to see it, and he was calling me and telling me what he could see, and that we were kind of operating it secondhand. Um, but this one will allow us to actually watch it and control it real time from home or from the office or on vacation. And that could help with like some damage control, couldn't it, in situations yes. like that? It's yes. a tremendous tool. Any yes, other comments or concerns? I have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Zach, if you're ever willing and have time, uh, come down. I'll gladly show you SCADA. Awesome. Thank you so yes, much. 7.7, 7. discussion and possible action regarding approval of the installation and removal of Christmas lights at WM Brook Park to H&H &H Tree Service in the amount of 30000 to be dispersed in three installments. Mayor, Council, as most of you know, H&H &H Tree Service has done the installation and removal of the lights for about the last three years. Mm -hmm. They've done a fantastic job, in my opinion. And we're just seeking your approval to go ahead and execute the agreement again as it's written. Same agreement we've had for the past few years. Nothing's changed but the dates. Could I get a motion? So moved. Second. I have a motion and a second. Are there any questions or concerns? Everybody good? Everybody All those good. in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank, Thank you, Chris. 7.8, discussion and possible action regarding a veteran's run and walk on Saturday, November 6, 
2021, starting at 8 a.m. Mayor, Council, um, good evening. Jackie Bunce, uh, the Veteran and Family Services Committee Chair for our local VFW, started out planning a little walk run with some friends and ended up coming up with a veteran's walk. <laughs> She's done a lot of work for this to come together. Um, she has insurance for her event. They're going to gather on the north side of the courthouse about 7.30 and have some sponsors there at that time. She's coordinated with the farmer's market to uh, incorporate and be in and out of there before the farmer's market. They're going to walk, run, walk from the courthouse, uh, Live Oak, 2nd Street, Chestnut, to Miller's parking lot for a photo op with a patriotic mural. And from there, they're going to uh, wind their way around sidewalks of the go to East 580, the sidewalks there, come around to Hackberry, and then from there they'll cross 4th Street, have a run that comes back, crosses them back over 4th Street, and then back to the courthouse. There are complete routes in your packet. Um, with that, we'll, we're asking permission to escort and to provide safety for this run for them. Um, so I'm asking for a mo um, motion to approve us to escort the event and to provide traffic safety. Primarily our concerns are just with 4th Street. It's not a sanctioned run, uh, so they're not timed. They'll be watching, but we just want to make sure that they're safe coming across back and forth on 4th Street. Great. Could I get a motion? So moved. Moved. Have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 7.9, discussion and possible action regarding the board appointment and reappointment on the Lampasas Economic Development Corporation. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, this is another one of my board appointments and reappointments. Um, I think I have three more boards left to present over the next probably, probably six weeks or so. Um, this evening, we're actually going to consider a motion to reappoint Roland Schaub and Steve Hepson and to appoint Ryan Shahan to the Lampasas Economic Development Corporation Board. They did meet on the 20th, and they do recommend approval as well. Move to approve. Got a motion. Second. And a second. Does anyone have any comments? Questions? All yeah. those in I'm sorry. I had a quick question because I noticed that, unless I'm just missing it, I noticed that Ronnie Vineyard reapplied, but he's not on the... That is correct. Um, the board discussed the um, numerous um, applicants that they had to fill those positions. And at the meeting, they opted to um, appoint somebody in a financial background. And that's why Ryan Shanahan was appointed from the board to your recommendation to y'all. Any other comments, questions? Have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. 7.10, discussion and possible action regarding the adoption of the 2021 ICC codes and the 2020 NEC codes. It's me again. Um, this is kind of giving you some background with regarding to going to the 2021 codes. Um, the city of La Paz has originally adopted technical codes back in 1995. Since that time, there have been two modifications. Um, in 2011, we did the 20. 2006 ICC codes and the 2005 NEC, which is the National Electrical and the International Code Council. Um, and 2015 was the most recent, and we went through and did the 2012 ICC, which is all the International Code Council code books, and the 2014 National Electric Code, and that's what we are doing today. Um, earlier this year, we went through a building code effectiveness grading schedule, um, and the ISR rating is affected when jurisdictions fall behind in our code cycles. So typically about every three years is when we get new codes. So we're quite significantly backlogged with or behind with regarding to our code adoption. Um, so we're trying to do this because it affects our ISO rating, which is kind of what we use for the underwriters to use and offer premiums and for residential and commercial properties. So we're trying to get a higher ISR, ISO rating. At the same time, we want to adopt the codes because we do feel it's in the best interest of the community. Um, we did have a um, town hall where we obtained builders, trades, and citizen feedback. We did that on September the 16th. We had about 35 people in, in, um, who were there and talked to us in various, whether it was a citizen or trades. Um, some council was there as well. Um, it was pretty effective. 
Um, the construction board, we met on October 21st to discuss the significant changes from the 2012 to the 2021, and they also are um, in favor of moving to the 2021 codes. Um, so we're asking for consideration for you to adopt the codes at the first reading of the ordinance this evening. However, we don't want to make them effective until January 1 of 2022. Okay. Move, move to approve uh, the first reading of an ordinance to adopt the 2021 International Code uh, and the 2021 National Electric Code. I'm sorry, Mr. Clark, I made a mistake on there. It is actually going to be uh, the 2020 National 20, Electric Code. Amend uh, to a 2020. Thank you. Okay, I have a motion. Second. I have a motion and a second. Are there any questions? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you both. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor, Council. We will adjourn into executive session and it will be to receive and evaluate financial information received from a business prospect to discuss same and or to deliberate regarding commercial or financial information that the city has received from a business prospect that the city seeks to have locate, stay, or expand in or near the city with which the city is conducting economic development negotiations and or to deliberate an offer of any financial or other incentives to other business prospects described above. Could I get a motion to adjourn? A moment. Second. All those in favor? Aye.